But first, the anatomy of violence. How does an innocent child grow up to become one of the accused Boston bombers? Or any criminal, for that matter? What is happening inside their brains? I will tell you it's controversial for sure, but scientists today say biology plays a much bigger role than we once thought. In the wake of tragedy come the inevitable questions. What makes a killer? Is there a switch that turns on a rampage? And why? Why would someone do this? You can just say the person's evil. I think that's 13th century thinking. I think we've moved beyond that. Adrian Rain is a criminologist. He's also the author of a new book, The Anatomy of Violence. He has spent more than three decades studying cold-blooded killers. He says there are biological explanations for violence. And Rain is convinced that brain dysfunction may, in part, explain the terror unleashed in Boston. Were they just completely normal people who just decided one day, you know what, we want to create mayhem? I don't think so. I think it's more complicated than that. You know, when you, when you see all the, um, the tragedies uh, that have happened recently uh, with uh, Jahar uh, Sarnayev or Adam Lanza, uh, with your background, your experience and what you've learned, what do you look for? What would you advise researchers uh, as, as they're investigating these cases? Well, you know, there's no research at all on terrorists or um, sort of mass murders at a biological level, but you can always speculate, based on what I've learned about violence, that, you know, with the bombings in Boston, these perpetrators, they did not have poor frontal lobe functioning. They were able to plan, regulate and control. Mm. So if I brain scan them, I don't think we'd see poor frontal functioning. But I think what we would see is an impairment, a volume reduction and poor functioning in a part of the brain called the amygdala. It's the seat of emotion. And we've been finding in our research on psychopathic offenders that these psychopaths have an 18% reduction in the volume in the amygdala and also when they contemplate making moral decisions like should I kill someone or not that part of the brain is just not as active as in normal people. But you've done a terrific job Adrian of really making the science I think accessible for people and, and I want to show a couple of images I think that are going to be important uh, here and people will see this again you should you should read the book but take a look there um, it's a scan uh, of the brain a PET scan um, normal on the left and uh, a murderer uh, on the right. What, what are we looking at there? Well, we're looking down on the brain. This is a PET scan, so it's looking at brain functioning. And the warm colors, the red and yellow, indicate high glucose metabolism or high brain functioning. And on the left there with the normal control, you can see there's a lot of good functioning in the very frontal region of the brain. See right at the top there. That orange that, yellowish that's area. That's right, yes, at the top. That's good frontal lobe functioning. But look on the right, the murderer, a distinct lack of activation in that very frontal region of the brain. That is an area of the brain that uh, is often associated with judgment, but also inhibition. Absolutely. It's part of the brain that regulates emotion, regulates impulsive action. A bit like the guardian angel on behavior, you know? Right. Or a bit like the brakes on a car. If the brakes are broken car gets out of control and the same can be true of an individual with poor frontal lobe functioning they can run out of control and become impulsively violent you 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 you, you make these uh, these um, uh, sort of revelations about what's happening in the brain but also the physiology for example I was fascinated when you talk about someone's heart rate something as simple as heart rate uh, with regard to what's happening in the brain and now their heart rate, what, what, what have you found? What we've been finding and what many researchers have been finding is that low resting heart rate is really one of the best replicated correlates of aggressive and violent behavior, not just in adults but also in children. And in part of these studies you took somebody and you put them in a condition, maybe had a loud noise or something, and tried to figure out does their heart rate go up uh, as you'd expect, and if it didn't, that was, that was a flag. Absolutely. You know, we put 1,800 three-year-old children into this experiment where we measured fear conditioning. Do they have anticipatory fear before a punishment comes on? And what we found is that the three-year-olds who really showed a lack of fear at that time, they were more likely to go on to become criminal offenders 20 years later.
the, the, as, again, as a neuroscientist, someone who's interested in this, if you know some of these risk factors now, which you, again, describe in the, in the book, is there something that can be done then at that point to say, look, we know we've identified the high-risk people because we have objective evidence that this has caused these changes in the brain. What can we do as individuals or as a society? We can certainly do th something to change things. And in fact, one of the reasons for writing The Anatomy of Violence is I wanted to open up a new door to everyone, a new way of looking at violence and the causes of crime and violence. And the brain can change for the better with a better environment. So, for example, we enrich the environments of three-year-old children by giving them better nutrition, more physical exercise, and a cognitive stimulation for two years from age three to five. That resulted in better brain functioning at age 11 and a 35% reduction in criminal offending at age 23. So it's not biology by itself. It's not the social environment by itself. It's the mix of them coming together that conspire to create the violent offender. Yeah, so for everyone who's out there measuring their heart rate or something <laughs> right now, it's not quite as simple as that. It's but not as simple as that, and I've got a low resting heart rate. <laughs> yeah, so I shouldn't be concerned. You're not at risk, right. no. And my thanks again to uh, Adrian Rain for joining us. Really fascinating stuff. And still ahead on SGMD, uh, see what TV show.